Greetings, y'all. Professor Hurley here, bringing you another cool topic in biology on purple bear biology. If you're new to the channel, we discuss cool topics on biology, microbiology, and anatomy. Consider subscribing to the channel if you're a student, or just find these topics as fascinating as I do. In this episode, we are going to take a closer look at chordate biodiversity and evolution. Have you ever wondered how evolution took place to give us the present-day biodiversity of phylum chordata? Wait, what is chordata? You've probably heard the words vertebrates before to describe organisms with a backbone, but vertebrata is actually a subphylum of the larger group called chordates. Why the separation? Well, all of the organisms in vertebrata have a vertebral column, but not all chordates have a backbone. If they do not all have backbones, then what do they have in common? There are four primary characteristics that organisms in this phylum share in common. A notochord, pharyngeal slits, post-anal tail, and a dorsal nerve cord. Let's take a closer look at each of these to explore their general function. The notochord is actually the structural support and can serve as protection for the nerve cord. I know what you're thinking. Wait, isn't that just a spine? And wouldn't that make these organisms vertebrates? Well, not quite. You see, there are groups of organisms that have notochords that never develop a backbone. Which ones? Well, enter these little cuties, the tunicates and the lancelets. This adult tunicate is a sessile filter feeder that remains stationary all through adulthood. How in the world could this be grouped in with the same evolutionary branch as something like a cheetah or an elephant? The offspring of tunicates in their juvenile stage are mobile, and they have a notochord, a nerve cord, a tail, and gill slits. Always remember that organisms can change through their development, and traits can be lost through that developmental process. Our notochord develops into our vertebrae that make up the bony structure of our vertebral column. Want another example of a characteristic loss through development? Sure, let's take a look at our next chordate characteristic, the post-anal tail. The tail has diversified functions ranging from mobility in trees to dexterity needed for flight. But many groups of chordates have a tail as a juvenile and lose the tail as they develop. One good example would be amphibians. Tadpoles have tails until they develop into frogs where the tail is lost. Cool fact alert, did you know that you had a tail as an embryo in your mother's womb? The characteristic is lost most of the time as the babies develop before they are born. Note that I said most of the time. There is a rare condition where humans can be born with a tail. Though this is exceptionally rare, it has been documented in medicine more than 40 times. And this is most likely the result of vestigial gene expression. What about the other characteristics? For example, the pharyngeal slits. These are also known as gill slits. In aquatic invertebrate chordates, these slits serve as the passageway for water to exit once it enters the mouth, and this is how they filter feed. What do you think? Did you ever have gills? You bet you did. Again, as an embryo, you had these types of gill slits. In terrestrial animals, these slits develop into the jaw. In other aquatic vertebrates, these slits develop into the gill arches that support the location where gills for respiration are found. The last characteristic is a hollow dorsal nerve cord. This feature develops into the central nervous system organs, the brain, and the spine. Okay, so all chordates have those characteristics, but now let's delve deeper into the chordate phylum and explore vertebrate diversity as well as their adaptations to land. Starting off with our aquatic friends, we can divide our aquatic vertebrates into three groups. Jawless fish, called hagfish that you see here, as well as fish with jaws divided into two groups carlaginous fish, including the sharks, rays, and something called a ratfish. The other group of fish with jaws include bony fish. This is probably the most familiar to you, because you might have gone fishing for them in a lake. Each of these groups have unique characteristics that cause them to develop onto different evolutionary branches, and the diversification of their adaptations is prevalent in the beauty of their biodiversity. All of those groups are aquatic organisms. What about terrestrial chordates? Well, to bridge the gap between water and land, we have to look at a transitional species of bony fish called the lobed fin fish. These fish are much like the common bass, catfish, or brim you might drop a bobber in the water for, but there are two incredible adaptations that they have. First and foremost, they have muscle and bone in their fins. They also have lungs and gills. So what do you think this let them do? Well, it let them transition to land temporarily to exploit terrestrial resources like algae growing on the beaches. Though most of the transitional groups have gone extinct, 
Some fossilized evidence is an organism called Tiktaalik that would have been thought to bridge the gap between aquatic organisms and terrestrial ones. So what do you think? Do we have any lobed finned fish that survive today? Yep, we sure do. We have an organism called a mudskipper that can bridge the gap of water to land and can walk on their front legs. For a cool video, check out this YouTube link to see the critter in action. I promise you won't regret it. Okay, so once we're on land, then what? Well, we move to our next transitional group, the class Amphibia. Amphibians have transitioned to land, but are still tied to the water. Let's explore how. First, they have to have external fertilization in the water source. Second, the offspring of most amphibians then require the water to develop to adulthood. And even as adults, they perform gas exchange across their skin, which requires it to be moist. Now, of course, they do have lungs, but they are more rudimentary structures compared to the advanced lungs that we'll see in later groups. Cool fact alert! Not all amphibians have their offspring develop in large bodies of water. Some cool adaptations include amphibians that lay their eggs in small ephemeral pools, or even in one species that gives live birth. Though, I should mention that these adaptations are rare and very species specific. From amphibians, we move on to our next vertebrate class, reptilia. Reptiles develop some of the key characteristics that allow them to branch onto land away from water a little more than their amphibian cousins. The first of these key adaptations is internal fertilization. Internal fertilization enables the mates to better ensure reproductive success as well as try to ensure paternity. That's right, one of the benefits of internal fertilization is that it means you're more likely to be the parent as opposed to external fertilization that enables any male that passes to potentially father some of the eggs. Their next really cool adaptation would be eggs. Eggs are hugely beneficial for stepping away from the water source as well. You can kind of think of these as private ponds that serve the function of letting the embryo develop with a protective outer covering. Last but not least of these key adaptations are scales. Scales are made up of a resilient protein called keratin. The protein makes them strong and watertight to avoid water loss through the skin. This adaptation creates new challenges as well. Because the skin is no longer moist, gas exchange can no longer occur across it. Thus, the respiratory system of these organisms is more advanced than amphibians. From reptiles, we move into the class Aves that contains birds. Now you all know that birds have feathers. But did you know that bird feathers are made up of the same keratin protein found in reptile scales? The arrangement of protein is different to reduce the weight and provide similar structural support. Birds also take huge leaps forwards in evolution for endothermy. This is regulating their own body temperature. Endothermy enables them to further develop onto land. And, of course, flight is hugely advantageous for movement, finding food, as well as mates, and escaping predators. Combine these characteristics with an incredible respiratory system and birds have really excelled at life on land. Our last group you are probably most familiar with, mammals. Class Mammalia is the class of organisms that you belong to. We can actually divide this class into three primary groups, monotremes, marsupials, and placentals. Though mammals are highly diverse, almost all of them contain similar characteristics including mammary glands for providing nutrients to their developing offspring and hair to help regulate body temperature. Hey, guess what hair is made out of? If you guess keratin, you're right. Your hair and fingernails are also made out of keratin, the same protein that makes up bird feathers, beaks and claws, and reptile scales. If that's not a cool link to our ancestry, I don't know what is. Now, monotremes are the most basal taxon of this particular class and include organisms like the duck-billed platypus. They also have features that make them very much like our bird and reptile relatives. For example, some of them produce eggs and they only have one hole called a cloaca where poop, pee, and reproductive fluids exit. This is the same thing for birds and reptiles. But, like other mammals, they have mammary glands, so we group them together. Marsupials and placentals are incredibly similar with one key difference, the development of their offspring. Marsupials give birth to their offspring that still have additional development needed to survive. In almost all cases, this takes place inside of a pouch on the mother. Placentals, however, have their offspring develop inside of a placenta until they're ready to be born. Of course, both groups provide parental care. The real difference is just the gestation period required before birth 
and how much development the offspring will have to do once it is born. While closely related in evolutionary history, these groups have been geographically isolated from one another, leading to differential characteristics that we can see between the two relatives. Isn't all of this biodiversity amazing? Well, that is it for this episode of Purple Bear Biology. If you liked the video and found it helpful, be sure to like and subscribe, as well as pass it along to others to explore. As always, thank you all for watching, and see you next time.